All of us are. Everything is already connected. We are reminded by the poem. How many of you are familiar with the poet Snap? So I invite you this morning to use the poet Snap as a sign of our connection if you hear something that resonates with you. All right. <laughs> Due to the events of last week, the title of this sermon has changed to a world made better by our collective power. A world made better by our collective power. We are bearing witness to the threat and harm of climate change. What a moment you have just had right here in Houston. The same week that events were happening leading up to Friday's Global March for Climate Justice. Last Sunday, I spoke in a kickoff event in Washington, D.C. And then this week, right here, we are bearing witness, you bear witness to the communities right here in Houston being flooded by the rains of Tropical Storm Imelda. The Texas Observer wrote that this was the fifth 500-year storm in the last five years. And Forbes reported this event as the second 1,000-year flood in two years. Forbes also states that the Northern Hemisphere just experienced our warmest summer on record, and the warmest five summers ever have been the last five years. Now, my previous career was in natural resource management, and our scientists have been sounding the alarm for at least 30 years against global warming. And we have leaders who not only deny the impending climate and environmental threats, but they are dismantling environmental and public health protections and putting many communities and ecosystems at risk. There is something very wrong when our youth have to take to the streets to demand that adults protect their lives and their future. There is something very wrong when leaders ignore these cries for help and accountability and continue to use their power in ways that alarm harm, that allow harm and destruction. How can we change the conditions that cause pain, suffering, and injustices? How can we bring healing to life and to the environment on Earth? There's a quote by James Baldwin that always gives me hope, and it might encourage you too. And although Baldwin was speaking to a group of writers, his message has universal value, and he said, I quote, you write in order to change the world, knowing perfectly well that you probably can't. In some way, your aspirations and concern for a single person, in fact, do begin to change the world. The world changes according to the way people see it. And if you alter, even by a millimeter, the way a person looks or people look at reality, then you can change it." End of quote. Baldwin was saying that we have the power to change the world if we change for the better 
what we and others do and see. So isn't this one of the reasons why many people come to church to change for the better the way that we see the world? There's something powerful in being a part of collective positive intention and action. And we know it in our bodies and our souls. We return to it over and over again on Sundays. And it's not just because going to church is a good thing to do, <laughs> although it is. <laughs> We return again and again because our souls are nourished by the energy in this sacred space. And this energy is something that we cannot create by ourselves. There's a great deal of power in the collective. A few years ago, this power became more than just an intellectual concept for me. It became a deep personal belief and the cornerstone of my faith. I am a humanist with agnostic beliefs. As such, prayer has not been a practice in my adult life. One day my sister was rushed to the emergency room where she went into cardiac arrest. The doctors diagnosed her with pulmonary embolisms and they put her in a medically induced coma. So it was out of our hands. There was little that we could do but wait and hoped for the best. Now we're five siblings, all grew up in a Unitarian church. And a steady stream of family and friends formed around us offering prayers and best wishes. Even strangers offered to pray for my sister by name. I graciously accepted. Prayer circles started forming in various cities where our friends were calling and asking their friends to pray for my sister. And as the weekend approached, I was trying to decide where it would be best for me to be on Sunday. Should I go and be a part of my own church community? Should I go to the hospital chapel for quiet reflection, or should I stay near ICU in case her condition changed? But truly appreciating how many people had been offering prayers, I realized that there was something I could do. I know a lot of Unitarian Universalist ministers across the country. I could ask them to pray. It was uncomfortable for me to ask, but I started writing to you, you ministers, on Facebook and by email to make the request. My message to them said, I believe in the power of collective thought and action. Will you ask your congregation to hold my sister and our family in love and prayers? Will you ask your church community to join us in sending positive healing thoughts her way? Three days later, my sister awoke from the coma with no pain and no memory of what had happened. The doctors and medicine took care of her physical body, but maybe prayer circles, congregations, families and friends around the country, maybe they provided a larger spiritual body of positive energy in support of her healing. She had a full recovery, and I had new insights and a lot of questions. <laughs> the agnostic in me is open to possibilities. <laughs> But just as I believe in the power of collective positive intention and action, I must reconcile with its opposite. Now, like many of you, I don't believe in evil as a supernatural demon or devil. But we have been confronting 
the power of collective negative intention and action for a long time. This is what movements are all about, building collective power to take on sources of power and authority that are deliberately doing harm to our communities. It is said in Unitarian Universalism that we do not have a theology of evil. Now, this conversation has been taking place for a long time. And I hadn't felt the need to think enough about it to really draw my own meaningful conclusions until a couple of years ago. And in light of what we are watching unfold now in our country, I am calling this claim of no theology of evil into question. We, Unitarian Universalists and progressives, are driven by the call to social justice, and this is our response to evil. You say it very clearly in your vision statement for this church, and I quote you, we join together on the path of spiritual and intellectual growth to promote and celebrate community, diversity, and social justice for a healthier and more equitable world." End quote. That's your statement. This call to social justice is central to Unitarian Universalist values and identity. We have a history of confronting the forces of injustice. Now, we might not use the language of evil, but I think it's time that we name the power of collective negative intention and action and articulate the theology that counters and eliminates evil. It helps to name things. We were not ready for what was coming our way a couple of years ago. The Martin Luther King philosophy of nonviolence identified the triple evils as poverty, racism, and militarism. Now I think we can add another one to the list, environmental destruction and species extinction. And now my intention today was to actually preach about hope, <laughs> and we're coming to that. My sister's recovery left me with questions. What if we really do have a power beyond our comprehension? How do we tap into it or harness it to make changes? How can we access that power and bring it into the ministries of our Unitarian Universalist congregations? Are we operating at capacity or do we unknowingly limit our power to change ourselves and to collectively change a piece of the world for the better? We can take some cues from scientists who are actually working to measure, measure the power of collective consciousness. Two leaders in this new consciousness are Dr. Joe Dispenza and Dr. Amit Goswami. Dr. Dispenza wrote in his book, Being Supernatural, that when they can get enough experienced meditators in a room, synchronizing their intention and elevating their consciousness, they, uh, elevating their emotional frequency, I'm sorry, the meditators can unify their consciousness and create measurable changes in the energy in the air. The power of this collective consciousness has been used in global peace experiments to reduce violence hostility, and crime. 
There have been a number of organized events. Uh, you might see some being organized now. And with thousands of experienced meditators meditating to try to impact violence, they have had success. The results from one of these events used transcendental meditation, and it showed a 76% reduction in war deaths in Lebanon and reductions in other acts of violence. That is remarkable. It was so remarkable that the study was repeated seven times each time with similar results. Now, Dr. Amit Goswami's work is described in the video, Quantum Activist. Familiar? He removes the division between science and spirituality by unifying the objective and the subjective realms. Or said another way, he unifies conceptually the material world of matter with the subtle, private world of thoughts, feelings, and intuition. Now there's a lot more than we can get into this morning, but just imagine the world that you see as you move through your day. Now, what if everything that we, everything that you see, all of the matter, what if that is all surrounded by an ocean of information that cannot be seen? What if the space around us is not empty? Behold, all of those seeds that you heard about in the children's story. What if it's full of information and possibilities and energy? What if everything that we see was actually created from that ocean of information? What if our collective power is our ability to unify our intention and our beliefs to the point that we shift some of the energy in this great ocean of consciousness to the point that it begins to manifest our intentions. If this is possible, then we have to ask ourselves, what information are we putting into the ocean of energy and possibility? How much time do we spend on negative versus positive emotions? How often do we sync our positive intentions with others? What if our fixation on the material world is an impediment to being able to utilize more from the great ocean of information and possibility? What if we are just way, way, way out of balance? What if we are so fixated on the results that we have shortchanged our ability to collectively create results? To right the wrongs of our history and those that are facing us today, which will be tomorrow's, wrongs of history. But also, what if there was so much positive, transformative energy emanated during the time leading up to the midterm election that we, that we actually shifted the energy around us in beneficial ways that were beyond our consciousness? Yeah? So if I ask you, how are you doing? If I asked you that before last week's flood, okay. If I asked you, how are you doing? Are you answering that question differently these days? 
I had a sense of foreboding when I spoke with congregations two years ago, real foreboding. That's where this whole conversation about evil came up. But I notice now that there's a flow. Yes, things are still hard, and we have a lot of challenges, but there is so much synchronicity happening now. And a lot of things are moving forward as though impediments are being lifted. You feel that? And, and the way is being cleared for greater cooperation and insights to be rooted in the day-to-day -day rhythms of our lives. My friends, I believe that we are witnessing the great turning. Now, no one said how long it takes, right? <laughs> this term, the great turning, is used by Joanna Macy and David Corton. And Corton describes it as, and I quote, the awakening of a higher level of human consciousness and a turn from an era of violence against people and nature to a new era of peace, justice, and environmental restoration, end of quote. And to put this great potential of shift in human consciousness into perspective, Dr. Dispenza suggests that we teach this way of thinking and meditation in our schools. And it's happening in some schools. And then not only will we have millions more people who can draw from and contribute positive energy to this larger ocean of possibilities, but it will become a way of life the same way technology is a way of life for young people today. This may in fact be one of our greatest hopes for the future. We can do more good things to create more good energy and connections that can neutralize or counterbalance this negative energy. So I suggest that you take more time for silence, stillness, and meditation. Get more deep sleep. Keep our minds and bodies clear. Listen to more good music. Laugh more. Plant more flowers in your garden. Doesn't it make you feel good when you drive past a nice colorful patch? Plant them for someone else. Express your gratitude more. Show up more for people and be a part of collective action. Read more to nourish your mind and plant those seeds. Connect more with those you know and connect with more new people too. Put out more that is positive and resist being inundated with negative energy. It's too easy to absorb it. Do more justice work, a lot more. Do more intergenerational work, a whole lot more. <laughs> Whatever you do, be intentional about giving more. Now, I'm not saying to wear yourself out, but if many of us just give more, we will contribute to the positive flow of energy that can be a source of hope for ourselves and others around us. This positive flow of energy that just might help to change the world. We can participate in that vision that Dave, James Baldwin helped us to see if we give more and if we change, and I quote, the way that we see and people see reality, even by a millimeter, come on, we can all do this, then we can actually help to change reality. Have faith that the little changes matter and collectively, they are powerful. And I want to close with an example of the power of our collective positive intention and action to change the world. In January 2019, we're still in 19, right? 
the most diverse group of legislators to ever serve this country were sworn into the House of Representatives in the 116th Congress. They are the most diverse in age, gender, race, sexual orientation, and religious affiliation, including two who are Unitarian Universalists. The energy of our collective consciousness is moving in positive directions. Women and youth have been highlights of this story. In fact, those two movements are coming together now around the New Green Deal. Be prepared. The Unitarian Universalists are supporting it. With intention, we can help create the environment for healing and transformation that we all so desperately need. Let our benediction today be a Leonard Cohen song recorded at my home congregation, All Souls Church in Washington, D.C., on the eve of the Women's March of January 2017. Raise your hand if you were there. All right, all right. The collective power that went into organizing women around the country and around the world got women into office and it will continue to affect the energy and the outcomes moving us forward. This is what we should celebrate and elevate. May we all do our part to help build the collective power of positive intention and action, and to bend, bend the moral arc of the universe toward justice and wholeness. We need this more than ever. So let us go forward with hope and faith, and remember we are already connected, and we can use our positive intention and action to make the world better. May it be so. And amen.